on-site gallery. My name is Linda Columbus. I'm the programs coordinator here at on-site. First, I'd like to start by acknowledging the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugans of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians of the land on which we stand and create. On-site gallery is the flagship professional gallery of OCAD-U and an experimental curatorial platform for art, design, and new media. Currently on view until December 10th are our two inaugural exhibitions in our new expanded space. Raise a Flag works from the Indigenous Art Collection 2000 to 2015, curated by Ryan Rice, Delaney Chair in Indigenous Visual Culture at OCAD-U, and For This Land Inside Elemental, presented with community partner Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival and featuring new work by Two Row Media, Jackson Two Bears, and Janet Rogers. So at the front desk, just so you're aware, and um, we're welcome to take some of our printed materials. We have two exhibition brochures, one for each show, as well as a brochure on an on-site gallery, as well as a list of our upcoming public events. So thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Lisa Myers Artist Talk. I'd like to welcome Maya Wilson-Sanchez, who will be introducing Lisa Myers. Maya is an emerging writer and curator. Her interests include studying performativity, language, and gender in contemporary art by Indigenous artists in the Americas. Maya has worked in collections, research, and programming roles at Onsite Gallery, X-Space Cultural Center, the Art Gallery of Peterborough, Gallery TPW, and the AGO. She is currently studying at OCAD University and working as a curatorial intern at the Royal Ontario Museum. So, hi everyone. I want to begin by saying that it's so wonderful to be here at Onsite Gallery's new location. Um, working here was my very first job within the arts and cultural sector and it taught me a lot about what I know today. So I feel very happy we have this wonderful space and I am excited about the new possibilities it will bring to the OCAD community and the greater art world in Toronto. So today we have the pleasure of learning about Lisa Myers' artistic practice. She's an independent curator, artist, and educator who has an MFA in criticism and curatorial practice from OCAD University. Myers is currently working in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University as an assistant lecturer. She's Anishinaabe from the Shabunaga and Bosley First Nations and is based in Port Severn and here in Toronto. Myers has exhibited her work in solo group exhibitions and venues, including Urban Shaman, the Art Gallery of Peterborough, and the AGO. Her writing has been published in exhibition publications, as well as the Journal of Senses and Society, C Magazine, and Fuse Magazine. So I had the privilege of meeting Myers in my first year of studies at OCAD. She was teaching a course in sculpture and installation with a focus on narrative strategies. I mention this because it was in this class where I learned something from Myers that completely changed my perspective regarding contemporary cultural production by indigenous artists. I learned about tradition, and not the European idea of tradition we are familiar with, where tradition is something static, something that we try to keep as unchanging as possible in order to maintain its integrity. The idea of tradition that I learned came from indigenous writers and curators, including Myers, which understands tradition as a dynamic practice that changes and adapts to fit the needs of its current community. This idea is still so incredibly revolutionary to me, and it made me realize that the continuation of cultures and knowledge of Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people can take on many forms and processes. Lisa Myers' work is an excellent example of this, especially the series of screen prints exhibited here, which employ a personal way of relating to land and demonstrates how personal history and cultural memory can be transmitted using new methods. The works we have here, titled Blueprints, are part of a larger body of work, which includes animations and performances that engage with blueberries as a material to think about land, and straining and absorbing as ways to survive through trauma, displacement, and oppression. Using walking and cooking as research methods, Myers' work is one of resistance, as it creates the room for continuation and a persistence of the strength and courage found within the transmission of family stories to the larger narrative of Canadian history. So thank you all for coming, and I welcome Lisa Myers to join. Just 
continue and keep talking about this and I'm sort of <laughs> sitting there. So, um, thank you so much and I want to begin by uh, thanking uh, OnSite for inviting me. Is this audible? Like, okay. Um, for OnSite for inviting me. Also, um, Ryan for including my work in this show. Um, you know, there are lots of works in this collection. I only have one work in this collection, so, you know, I really do appreciate you including me and being in the company of artists that I admire very much, artists that I've, I've studied, and, um, yeah, it's, it's very, it's a real honor. Um, okay. so many ways to begin. There's so many ways to begin. So I will start by saying that my name is Lisa Myers, as you know. Um, I grew up on a farm in Milton. My mother was born in Shawanaga, First Nation. And if she were alive today, she'd be a band member at uh, Christian Island, otherwise known as Osley First Nation, otherwise known as Chimna Singh. My dad's um, family settled in Oakville, and he was Austrian and English. That's one way to start. Um, near Oakville, uh, there was a place called Clarkson. There is a place still called Clarkson. But, um, a, time, a time when Clarkson was fields. There was a time when it was fields of fruit. There were berries growing there. And um, this was in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, and there were apples growing, there were also apples growing all around, there were apples growing in Collingwood as well, and people moved from, um, people, my family moved from uh, the reserve, a reserve from Shawanaga area down to Clarkson for a wage labor to pick fruit. And so there's these fields of strawberries and the migrant laborers that moved there from these reserves went there to earn money to pick fruit. And that's where my mother ended up living for a few years and that's how she ended up meeting my father. Okay, I'm going to start over. Bojo, Miss Away Gummy Crane, Dishnikaz, Wapsha Shido Dam, Chimpusing and Donjama. I just said, hi, my name is Center of the Water, and, woman, and um, I'm from Chimpusing, Big Island, it's in Georgia Bay. I began with the basics an action of picking and gathering, an act that I imagined my mother and her mother each bent down to these small plants and berries as people who moved south to work on farms and pick odamen or berry, heart berry or strawberries. Looking back further, they were picking from the plants that grow on their own, on their own, not cultivated, but grow on their own. Uh, those little blueberries. After a fire hundreds of years ago, the fire left the soil a balance of acidity to grow these little plants. Those, those plants that grow are the blue ones, the mini and the blueberries. This is the point where I'm, I was thinking about um, the food that comes from the place where some of my family is from. I'm thinking about how food represents that place and when you become connected to the place, you know the food you can get from it. I cook and from those berries I'm able to make the color I need. The color fades after a time, but after boiling and straining, the consistency is smooth, uncomplicated, consistent, and desirable. Straining is a strain, and leaves behind the seeds and skin. Absorbing, happen absorbing happens without me noticing, without realizing I'm nearly seeped in it. The skin seemed to be where the color is. So I'll take all the skins and make an ink, mix it with uh, transparent screen printing, so the skins will get ground up and I'll mix it with that liquid, and then I can make these maps. And the skin color fades after a couple of years, maybe a little bit. 
The skin, I feel, I realize, needs the inside of the berry to keep the colors rich and vibrant. I'm just going to start over. This work came from the kitchen and from my, my time in the kitchens. These kitchens were domestic, some were professional, some were around a fire, like for, for real, you know, cutting meat with a group of women and cutting the meat small enough anyone could eat it with a spoon. Here are the many forms that, that worked with the berries. Here are the many forms that I worked with. Here are the many forms of the berries that I worked with. So this is, um, these are, uh, this is a puree of berries. So I boiled the berries and then kind of strained them. And then when they were strained, I was able to uh, get the skin and the seeds and it dried into this sort of crunchy uh, leather kind of thing. And then I ground it, so I got this purple powder. I dried what was left and can dry it into a powder. And I'm also really interested on, in the way that these, what's left behind kind of looks like bear food. I wanted to see how things absorbed paper and wood soaking in the berries, they mapped their own story. So I left the, I left um, paper sitting in this puree to just let it absorb. I actually couldn't stop it. I think of these absorptions and stains as horizon lines. From the UBC archives I found this amazing file um, that shows the profile, the rise, the horizon of the sea of the CP rail, and it goes, this is only a section of it, uh, but this file, it's like, a, it's a, this blueprint for the, um, uh, that goes from Quebec City to Vancouver, and it shows all, uh, it shows the horizon line, or the rise, or the uh, elevation, all the way up. And these spoons are from an animation, uh, still from an animation uh, that I created. So I created, I created that horizon line with the blueberries. Um, during the summer of 2009, I walked with my cousin and her son from the site Shinkwa Presidential School in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, which is right next to Garden River, uh, if anybody knows that community. And then we walked to Espanola, Ontario. And we were following this route, we were following the route um, that was told to us, this route that we, um, learned about from my, the story from my grandfather. And this story involved that he ran away from the residential school along the train tracks. And this was in the early, this was 1919. There were no roads from Sault Ste. Marie to Espinola. At that time, from the story, they were just starting to blast the rock to put the road in. And so during his, his walk with this other boy, they um, followed the train tracks. And his, from his account of this journey, uh, I learned about certain sites. I, I, certain sites stood out to me, and this, uh, these sites have ended up becoming maps, uh, what I call blueprints. Um, and this site, which is the, this is the, one of the maps from the blueprints. It's the first one, first map um, that I made with blueberry pigment. Um, is a site where uh, this is the Mississauga River coming down into Lake Huron. And this is uh, the railroad, and there's a big, big uh, metal trestle bridge that goes across that river. And so when you get to that, when you get there, um, when I got there, it was very high up. And um, I looked down. When I looked down, I could see the water rushing. And when I tried to get my balance, um, I, um, the wind would, the gust of wind would come and I'd feel off balance. And then I'd look down to get my footing and then I'd see the water moving. So the traveling across, walking across the bridge was uh, one of the, was very difficult. And um, what helped was my cousin's son was really confident on this bridge. Uh, he was balancing on this, uh, on the rails. 
Yeah, I was on the ties, walking, you know, the ties with the whole, with the gaps, and he was on the rail, and he was like just balancing like this, no problem. But I felt like my my presence was helping him. I felt like I had to be there in case he lost his balance, and then he, I think, would thought he was there for me because I was really scared. So we got across that bridge, and the account uh, from my grandfather was that at this point was the first time he heard his language when, uh, since he had left school. Um, or since he had left home, actually, because that's school he had to speak English. Um, at that point, he heard his language, and he saw people cooking down by the, by the river. And they invited him, and they were so happy to see him and his friend. And they invited him, and they fed him, and they sent them on their way with some food. Um, during his continuing on this, this, this walk, um, he said uh, that he lived, he said that, but except for that food, he pretty well lived on blueberries for about a week. And um, and so from that, I started thinking about, and after I did this walk, I started thinking about the work that I would make uh, in response to the walk. And I decided to use the blueberry pigment. And this is, the, as I said, the first series. This is the first time. So in this series, I used just the skins that were uh, strained, dried, and ground, and I mixed it with um, screen printing ink, transparent, and I got this like kind of purplish color, but eventually it's sort of a tea stain now, as you can see on the wall. I call these, um, I call this uh, body work uh, blueprints, and I think about the stories we hear, the things we witness are like blueprints for ourselves how we locate ourselves and how to have a sense of belonging. Um, they don't, these things, these stories don't determine who we are, but they are a part of us, or a part of me. I feel that it's a part of me. When uh, the blueberry, when I, as I mentioned, I, I mix the skins with uh, blue transparent screening. Um, but in this instance where I did this wall print, I used, I pureed the blueberry um, and left it all together. I didn't strain it. Unstrained. Actually, I strained it a little bit, but I didn't strain it. <laughs> but I didn't strain it. I didn't just use the skins. The point is, is that the interior of the blueberry um, and the skins together made the color fix better. And um, as you can see, this pigment anthocyanin, which is in all the red vegetables and fruits. Um, as you can see, it's very red on the printing pad. So I made this printing pad with a rolling pin with this train track uh, carved into it. It's very red. And then when it hits the gallery wall, which is like, it has a warm and alkaline uh, quality, it turns this blue color. So the, the, the material itself, um, reacts to its environment, reacts to the acidity and alkaline. And you see that through the color that it ends up being. And so going from the story that started me looking at all of, started me using blueberries, I started to really think about the material itself and the, mater the way that material um, functions and acts. And is, I use it kind of metaphorically. This is the first animation I did, um, right after I tell you this. So here, where I started, um, I started placing spoons and lining them up and creating these kind of horizon lines and these kind of gathering lines and these kinds of oblong, circular, circular kind of shapes with them. 
At first it was a photo series, and then it became this video kind of performance as I started arranging the spoons. And then I realized that this repetition of spoons, and each spoon was like becoming like a frame of a sort of story. So I thought about instead of laying these spoons beside each other, if I if I over if I did a frame by frame uh, piece, which it would be an animation. So that led me. Thank you. And um, when I exhibit that, um, well, often when I exhibit that, not always, uh, I usually, I have, the original plan is that you, I have a parabolic speaker above so that you're quite immersed in the water sounds. Okay. The other, um, the other piece I will actually, yeah, I'll show you that one too. I started thinking about um, the action of straining, which I use to make um, this blueberry pigment. So I use the strainer. So in this image, it's still from a, a process kind of video piece that I did. Um, and I strain the berries through this kitchen strainer. And then the yellow surface is a screen for screen printing, but it has no design on it. And then I use that screen as another strainer to, that is actually a higher res strainer. So you even, I even strain even more out of the berries. So the process I go through in this, they're usually like, there are about, there's five of them that I've made, and there's, there are 10 minutes or so. Um, and it's a process of straining through this first strainer and then straining it through the last strainer and then there is a print at the end which has been, there has been multiple pulls, pulls and pulls and pulls and the action is a sort of straining, it's a strain, it's a physical strain to keep doing it but it's also uh, straining more and more out of, out of the berries. Um, and so this, I was thinking about that and the idea of absorbing of these two things that kind of are similar to what happens when you eat something. Um, it's similar to the way that our bodies work, but also it, it's this uh, metaphor for the strain of a social strain of how we um, how we survive in a in socially, how we survive and how we contend with the rules of the world, uh, our societies, maybe, and absorbing is what what is it that we absorb or choose to absorb or resist absorbing um, to also survive. So I was thinking about those in a really metaphorical kind of way. So I'm going to show you this other um, animation which is a little more whimsical than that notion that I just described. Um, and it's called uh, 
Stop motions take a long time to make. <laughs> well, that's why they're short. Uh, but they do, they do take quite a lot of effort and strain. Um, the first animation I showed you, though, uh, was a, um, I was really fortunate. It was my first stop motion animation like within this decade. I made some in the 90s, but I probably won't revisit those with you. Um, and I, was, I had the fortune to work with this animator, Raphael Aquino who's now living in the West Coast, but she's a meticulous animator. So I learned, uh, I learned from a very uh, good teacher and also um, would explain why my first animation is probably better than the second animation <laughs> um, in terms of it being kind of you know, uh, very smooth. Um, so I'm going to move from those, uh, I'm going to move into how I've used uh, performance and berries and food um, to this project, which is called Shore Lunch. And Shore Lunch started as in dedication to my mother, who I was told stories about her, that she was really, really good at fishing. And this is not something I knew about my mother. I did not know she did this, uh, or I didn't know that side of her. And um, her, one of her favorite things was to go fishing and then pull up on the shore and fry up some, have a shore lunch. And, some people call it that. Um, and so I made this shore lunch project out of, uh, in dedication to her. However, I've never cooked fish uh, at my shore lunch project. It's been, um, sometimes I share uh, printmaking with people. So this was at Toronto, at the Toronto Harbor Club, uh, which you know, used to be an industrial kind of area that is now revitalized and uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a tourist destination. However, it's still bracketed by the Red Path Sugar Factory and, and this old, uh, old multi uh, tower, which is no longer functioning. But the Red Path is. So I was thinking about that when I put this project together too, like how I would acknowledge the sugar production and the, the sort of uh, flour or barley um, processing that happens happened in that industrial area. So I was in using food and um, also doing making postcards for the passersby. So this was like very much having to interact with the um, public uh, who was not expecting to encounter an art an art thing in the middle of everything. So that was challenging. Um, but I had this make so this is a makeshift kitchen um, which I called there and this old pickup truck and we had a little bit of a wall tent and we had sort of a faux um, fire pit. And we had three different iterations at the Harborfront. One was this one, making mark, leaving marks, which I was handing out this postcard to include her achievement. Another uh, time was a nighttime um, display of the, one of the animations that I showed you. It was a nighttime screening, screening, and I was also giving out um, uh, fry, mascon, we call it, fry bread, and um, blueberry juice. And then on the last one, we did Melody McIver and I collaborated and we made, we wrote songs. We wrote songs for the berries and wrote songs for the water and for fish frying and wild rice. And so we played, I played um, my guitar and I'm like a self-taught kind of punk rock guitar player from the 90s, from the past. And she is a, she is a trained uh, viola player. So there was those sorts of worlds we brought together to make this music and to write this music for this, this di these different food pieces. And then I also did um, 
Yeah, so this is a shot of me sharing some drinks and postcards at Harbor Club. And then uh, the project, I was able to take it to uh, Ottawa, to the Rideau Canal, Rideau River. This was where, where it's the river before it's made into the canal at Carleton University. And um, I added these picnic blankets, which I made from old money bags um, that were deleted. And they're from the Royal Canadian Mint. I found them in this store in Saskatoon. And I bought a whole bunch of them. And I started sewing them together. <coughs> and uh, I had some help uh, ripping them apart, actually, from Anna, Anna at INBC. She helped me rip some of these bags apart so I could sew them together. So that was really helpful. Um, and I, so I made these these picnic sites right by the river and I we shared some food but also I talked about um, my walking across that bridge that story of walking across that bridge in uh, this at the Mississauga River uh, this site had a train track and a bridge as well and a river so we were kind of like inhabiting the site bring the site that was between Sault Ste. Marie and Espanola um, stories from that site here to this I also did this in Montreal, and I think that those are the three places that it has visited so far. Um, my Sharon Berries uh, also continued uh, during my residency at the UGO, and um, throughout the time I was in residence, we had a, I had different classes from OCAD. I had the ABC um, group come and I shared berries with them. I had a, uh, of the ACC come and share berries. Lots of acronyms. Um, different uh, people, also just uh, people that I would happen to meet in the gallery and say, hey, you wanna, wanna have some berries? Let's go to my studio. And then we would share berries and have conversation and talk about um, the work. And sometimes people would, often people would, um, the berries would end up bringing up something for them, and they would talk about uh, an experience of picking berries, or maybe they were from, there was a person who was from I think, Norway, who also picked blueberries in Norway. Um, there were different kinds of exchanges that happened. And so, most everyone was willing to donate their spoon back to this project, and I made, um, uh, in the gallery I made this wall print, but then I also lined up the spoons after I finished animating them. And I made this collect, what I call the collective animation of these spoons. Um, similar to the Strain and Absorb video. Um, the video showed these large close-up of these spoons, except that I didn't arrange the horizon line. The horizon line was determined by the marks that people left after they ate the berries. Um, and so, it was slightly more random, and then I lined them up uh, and animated them as I saw. I, I created, um, I chose the ones that I thought would go nicely together and make kind of sense of a landscape. Um, this uh, this was displayed at the Lake Launch, which was uh, uh, it was the project was called Each Portion and. We had three really large 16 by 9 um, screens like this. And the way that the spoons flowed, it, it guided the people through the institution. So it kind of, it kind of um, flowed in the direction that we wanted people to move through the institution. And then there were smaller screens of it in other places in the gallery, which also moved in the direction we wanted people to move. Um, so the process of making it was really important, the connections people, uh, also the stories shared were part of that process, and then the end piece, the collective animation was, uh, was, was, you know, the resulting work that people saw that night, but the backstory was really important to me. Um, uh, and then this work, uh, which uh, Ryan, actually started, <laughs> invited me. I hope you're okay when I talk about this. But um, this, I thought this was an interesting place to go from, you know, from a story I realized from, from this point of just playing, honestly, just playing strawberry dip spoons because I cook for a living and I 
I liked the quality of this thing, of these, of this very, um, this very puree, and I thought about the way that it made marks to um, the use of the pigment in this piece, uh, which has a really, you know, a story that is from my family that is passed on to me, that it feels like a gift in a way, but also feels like an indicator of, of what my family, you know, sort of went through. And then to this day, where um, Ryan, Ryan Rice organized um, uh, organized a uh, four-hour reading of the calls to, for calls to action from the Peace and Reconciliation Commission. So setting up in the in the in the lobby of, of the big of the tabletop building at OCAD, um, setting up the stage and the microphone, and um, having copies of the Ninety for Calls to Action and letting people go up and read what, whatever sections they wanted. And whenever they finished, the next person who was in line, which is right here, this was the lineup, could uh, then assume the stage and take the mic and read for as long as they wanted to. Um, in the middle of it uh, was a performance by Janet Rogers. And her performance, spoken word piece, was really important, I thought, to the whole process because it brought up critique of it. It, it brought up some critique and some questions around uh, the the results or the the results of the commission, the question of the finances of I guess the the, the value of um, like what's at stake within these calls to action as well. So that was a really great critical voice. And um, what was important? So I was invited to do something to engage the, engage people, something maybe visual. I wasn't sure exactly. But then I thought I would, uh, I thought about people speaking, uh, reading out these calls to action. I thought about people hearing things, hearing these calls to action, and the effect it might have on people. Um, because it's not only a call to action, it's also a call to remember, and a call to think about, and a call to reflect on our roles, and our responsibilities, and, and also the, the histories, histories of trauma, really. So um, I thought my intention was in sharing berries was to share it with people who are speaking or people who were listening um, to sort of feed them in a way that they could uh, it's almost like getting the nutrition you need to uh, make it through and also to be able to be present to listen and to think think about uh, more difficult shared history and so during the reading I literally went around with you know offering people um, berries with spoon Little these little wooden birch spoons, <clears throat> and and um, then ask them to sit down and sew with a little line of beads the spoon onto this fabric. Also, Ryan had a good idea to use to have these ribbons so that we could write uh, words that stood out to us or ideas that came to it, that stood out to us to write them on these these um, ribbons, and we could stick them on the wall. And what came to be also, so they were sticking these ribbons on the wall with different birds. Um, but also, what was really nice is that there was, uh, we had, I had these paper cups that um, we served berries in. And they're kind of like those portion cups. I think in the hospital, maybe they put their pills in, but they're a little bit bigger. And you can kind of pull them apart. So they're just these like really round piece of paper that's folded up into a cup. So you can pull them apart and they kind of open up. And people started sticking them on the wall. And that wasn't really part of the plan entirely. But the beautiful thing about it was there was this wall with all these like red kind of pock marks. And, and I remember standing back from it and thinking, <clears throat> they kind of look like wounds. They kind of look like shots, like bleeding shots, wounds on the wall, you know? And there was this sort of, this idea that, um, that, 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 by you know reading these things out, we were kind of exposing these these marks, these like moods, these these <clears throat> anyway. I'm really, I really thought that um, that came out of it, uh, not entirely intentionally. The, the pieces on the wall. It was sort of it was really striking to me. And even though I've come to things out, that that was something that came out of that was really um, important. But anyway, so then we, I asked people to sew with one line of beads these spoons to the to the, in a line, 
uh, to this fabric. And to kind of create a, to create a document that represent, re represented that moment and that day. Um, and that, yeah, that day that people gathered to speak and stopped to listen. And um, so it's, I think it's the things in the wall in um, the IMDC Main Street Center office, I'm not sure. <coughs> but it's, it's, it did exist last time I saw it. I know that one day, the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, Ron, I don't know what it was, like months ago, you said to me, well, they're kind of fading, you know, they're kind of fading. And I was thinking, well, maybe it's the kind of thing that we need to do again to renew it, you know? Um, it's maybe, or maybe it needs to be renewed in a different way. But I think that uh, you can't, I think it's worth doing more than once, you know? Um, but that's kind of where I wanted to um, end because I feel like it's a nice way to think about these stories um, and to think about where a story like that can lead to. Um, and yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say. And I wanted to maybe, I'll just finish one more thing, is that this idea of straining and absorbing um, has, have become these interesting metaphors. They're not, they're not just um, how, like when we consume food, there's a kind of absorption that happens. There is a kind of straining that happens. <laughs> but um, I also think of them as these, do think of these as, as these metaphors of like, how do we present ourselves? How do people, how do people see us who do they see when they see us, and what do we share with them about us, um, and how do we, uh, how are we, how do we locate ourselves within um, a social situation where it can be stressful and it can be um, there can be lots of pressures, and um, so I was thinking about that with this work. In, in the using strain and absorbing as a metaphor. Strain. Are there any questions or comments or thoughts that come to mind? Would this be a good time to ask or a good time to open it up? There's all the quiet people here. So the piece that's in the exhibition, the four blueprints. Yeah. Um, so printmaking is a process of straining. Mm -hmm. right? Did that is that something that came to be because of what you were doing with the with berries? Or um, okay. Well, uh, do you mean did I choose grain printing because it was a straining process? Well, first of all, I first started trying to print with blueberries. I tried to do relief print, and I tried to do, it was a, uh, somebody I was in residence with was doing a monotype uh, uh, workshop, and he said, can I just try my workshop on you? And I said, okay, but as long as I can print with blueberries, and he's like, okay. So it was a mess, right? Like, we pushed this thing, this, this plate through the press, and like blueberries everywhere. And, um, so then I realized, okay, this is not the right process. I need to, I think screen printing will be the best. It wasn't until I, this, uh, thank you for asking this question, because um, it wasn't until I um, started making these maps. So this this was the first iteration of maps. There's a second one, and there's a third one, and a fourth one. But the second one, I was in residence at Banff, and I was doing this other um, series that was another space. It was actually Garden River, where the bridge goes over the river in Garden River, and it says this is Indian land. So the map is of that site. So that's another place my grandfather went. Um, anyway, I was making those, and I had them in the studio, and then I went away for the weekend to see my uncle, and he lives in um, BC. And uh, when I came back to my studio, I just like looked at these maps, and I was, I just thought, what am I doing? Like, why am I illustrating this? Why am I, I just had all this, like, 
anxiety about it, and I, I was sort of like, I didn't understand, I was not liking what I was doing. I didn't really like that I was just sort of illustrating the story or something. And it depended so much on the story, it depended so much on me telling everybody every, all the time. And I started getting, I started feeling that um, problem. I felt it was a problem, or it was stuck. The work was stuck. So, it wasn't until then I sort of made that connection between the straining of, like, in, so that's when I started making this. So I said, like, I'm going to stop illustrating this, and I'm going to start, like, really thinking about the material. And so then I was like, yeah, I'm straining. Like, I, I'm going to strain on here. And then I was like, yeah, that's the moment when I realized that I am straining through the screen, too. And so I'm going to maximize that by just making the work about straining through the screen. So that was the next series that I did, which had resulting print, prints, but, um, yeah. And so, so I, I, the material kind of like made me think it would work best under, under screen printing, for screen printing. Uh, but then I didn't really realize, or it wasn't really conscious that it was a strange thing until I got really sick of my own self. <laughs> In a sense. Or just sick of that place I got to with the work, that I didn't feel like it could go anywhere else until I, yeah. So that's a long answer, but killed some time. And have you uh, noticed any uh, transformation from when you first printed them to them being exhibited now? Uh, well, they 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 seem pretty stable from the moment like when I transported this work to Ottawa. Uh, but from you can even see a little more of a purple tinge. To, this is like a shot from the studio when I first printed it. Um, so you can see it's turned to this more tea stain, kind of a beige color. And as I mentioned, this is uh, the work that was just with the skins, no, none of the pulp from the various skins and transparency. So, I haven't seen too much more happening with it. It seems to be pretty stable now. Um, yeah. But I think I want to show you. I'll show you the ones that, so the ones I did that, I, I didn't want to put them in this presentation. So these ones, this one, um, so this is the one series that I did when I was, that's when I got sick of myself. <laughs> this is the second series. So this is Garden River. Um, the train track goes right here. So you know that bridge that says this is Indian land? That's the garden there. That's the garden river. It goes into uh, sort of the upper kind of direct channel. And, um, and so that's made with the blueberry pulp, like the entire blueberry, not just taking the you know, and it kept its purple. It's faded slightly, but not, not as much. So it, it was really interesting to that, to just as over, being overly metaphoric, as I seem to be. Uh, but I started thinking about like how all the elements of that berry needs, it needs itself to, to be able to be kind of shiny. So. Okay. Lisa? Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, I have a question for you. Though. Okay. You know where I live with my work. So, yeah. Um, I just was thinking about how your whole practice, your whole process is one of historical history making, or remembrance. Yeah. 